this is um, Kleiner's um, sort of event series focused on early stage companies, typically 12 to 200 people. So tonight, thank you everyone for joining us. Tell me about the structure of marketing communications in your individual organizations. These days, we've typically got a country manager and you have someone that's responsible for marketing, what we think of really traditionally as paid acquisition. Uh, that reports into our country manager. And we've also learned that it works most effectively to have a dedicated communications person mm -hmm. per country. And I'm speaking specifically about how we tend to think about marketing and communications in our country offices. So in places like Canada and Japan and Australia where we operate, as opposed to how Square does things out of headquarters. Today at Pinterest, um, we have a centralized marketing team. Um, we have offices today in five countries, so in the UK, France, Germany, Japan, and Brazil. We have comms, we have one comms person outside the US today. Wow. Um, we are looking to hire um, individual country, uh, country PR people. And I agree with, with you very much that the, the real key is having that local touch and having those local PR managers. Today, marketing, since it's based in headquarters, um, is fairly removed from what's happening in country. So um, PR really serves as a function of the brand. So we are, PR is product awareness and education. Um, it's building the brand, and it's also just trying to drive momentum. So it's actually, it's a really great opportunity for PR because we're kind of carrying the, the weight of the brand. So my story is a little bit more of the building from scratch um, story as I was the first marketing hire to join. So I joined when we were a team of five um, and had we, you know, our founder would jump into Facebook and like run some Facebook ads and, you know, really do <laughs> some like some, some light marketing. Um, but when I, when I joined, what I really wanted to do was run a lot of tests and figure out what was working and what was not working and really double down on the things that we were seeing traction with. And what that has really informed is how I've structured my entire team. So that's really what I'm, I'm trying to do is, is structure the team where we have senior leadership who, um, you know, low ego, really excited to get their hands dirty and really want to be part of building and then really building functions underneath them where we're seeing traction. Super interesting. So you talked a little bit about going into market, and I'm really curious about how much work you do to understand those local markets but before you actually um, expand. So can you talk a little bit about the, the resources, the market research that you're actually deploying before you actually have, you know, business on the ground. Yeah. So I think we're really unique in this and because we have physical operations in every city in which we operate. Um, so, sorry, I, I'm saying this as I'm realizing that you might not know what SHIP is, as we're probably the youngest guy on the panel, but essentially mm -hmm. what SHIP is, is we are a mobile app, you can take a photo of an item, and then we have an entire network of couriers on the ground that will pick up your item in 20 minutes or less. In San Francisco, our average pickup time is about eight minutes. So that we then go back to a physical space, um, we have a warehouse in every city where we have a team of guys and gals who will professionally package your item and send it out using the lowest cost. So. Um, what we, we have a physical operation in every city that we operate. So as we know we're launching cities, we actually go in about eight months beforehand um, and set up our physical operation. Now the lease on those spaces gets signed at least 12 months before we go in. Um, and so it, operationally, we have to have commercial real estate people and that we learn a ton of insight from them. And that kind of, we learn from our operations team what we're looking at, who seems really interested in what, the concepts that we're building as we're like starting to set up shop there. And then what my team does is we go through a formal RFP process to find a local agency for each city that we go into. We do a three month commitment, but really six months ahead of time, we learn a ton about what SHIP means to that city before we go in. So um, we rely on this local PR agency to say, LA is a really great example. Um, where we'll say to them, you know, startups love using us in San Francisco, and that's where we we got our, our first traction. Well, how does that translate to LA? And they're they're like, well, the people who ship the most in LA and are going to help your product grow organically is definitely the fashion community. They're sending out samples all day long. Who are the highest frequency shippers? Um, and the, really, we gather a lot of ideas, and then we pick the agency that we think has has the best ideas, and then. Um, you know, that's just on the PR side of things, but then once we know what the demographic is, we kind of compare that against the early user research and then our growth strategies like deploy from there. Uh, we have this awesome kick um, research team that is a part of our marketing group. We use them to go into market also as an advanced strategy and they 
host focus groups and do deep dive ethnography work. And what we see is that there's a lot of consistency in what pinners around the world are looking for content wise, but 80% of our users are on mobile. So what we, when we go into each of the markets, mobile speeds definitely impact the content that you can discover. And so we work with those local pinners to try and understand, okay, what, what kind of content are you trying to surface? What are the speeds? Like that helps in, inform product decisions. From a PR perspective, what's great is I love the partnership between PR and research because PR can be such a, a leading indicator of the health of your brand. So whatever a journalist is saying to you in market about their perceptions of your brand, um, I hear that from journalists first, and then I can validate it if we're also hearing that from pinners. So that can also help inform decisions. So I love this partnership that we have with the research team. Yeah, I think you're going to hear a couple of similar themes yeah. echoed here, but something that I think Square does remarkably well is we also have an in-house team of the anthropologist in me, I like to call them ethnographers, but they refer to themselves as user insights experts, but mm -hmm. they, you know, basically every time we've made a decision to launch into a new market, they're the advanced team. They go in there, they bring our product managers and our um, soon to be publicly kind of disclosed country managers, and we'll spend a ton of time, weeks, on the ground talking to small business owners and really mining that rich qualitative data to understand where folks see the value, where there might be hesitations, where the product is intuitive or not intuitive. I think there's a very good discipline, especially on the product side of that organization, of baking those insights into the way that we build product to the um, user flow. I think it, um, it is also super important to build with intention the discipline of bringing that into your marketing and PR functions because it exists in one part of the organization doesn't necessarily mean that it diffuses every year. And I think um, sometimes we can learn the best and the fastest where that doesn't work very well. But all of a sudden, the launch happened. The Japanese was beautiful and seamless. The UI on the product was fantastic. Folks in Japan really appreciated the attention to design and the product. But we went to the website and we had green tea ceremonies and tatami mats. And there was this <laughs> feedback of, wait, that's maybe how Americans conceive of what's Japanese, but that's certainly not what the local conception is. So going back to this point of how important local relevance is and making sure that you're playing back to folks the way that they perceive themselves in your marketing and communications materials, we very quickly did a whole new set of creative work and brought it in-house. So I think there was a really good lesson there, not just in the elements that are most important in the marketing material that we put out, but also in, on the operating side that especially in some of the most foreign markets, that was where it was most, um, most important to have a lot of creative control to make sure that we were doing that on our own and kind of making those decisions very intentionally. So beyond actually stripping away um, sort of the added features and getting down to the core, what were some surprises that you saw when you went into expand to new markets of things that had to be localized? Like what are things that people should be expecting? Like we must localize. There's some probably a short list that you know are pretty obvious things, and then things that were more of a surprise. I mean, for us, um, I mean the localization piece is just it's just no joke. It's it's yeah. um, you know language obviously is the barrier, but with that it's it's nuances. It's being able to. Um, work with your on on the back end with things as, as simple as like football in the UK is very different than soccer in the US. Um, that's probably the most common example that we use. It's, it was sort of an obvious, oh, if I'm a pinner in France and I pull up football, I don't want to see the Super Bowl. I don't want to see recipes pertaining to, you know, Cheetos and sour cream. Like I want to actually see um, content that's that's local and relevant. And I think that from a back end engineering perspective, I think that's what is so there's a great story in kind of what we're trying to really build. And we often talk about Pinterest not being a social network. And the reason why is, you know, Facebook and Twitter is about, you know, kind of what's happening now or just happened. So from a if you're trying to pull up information, it just happened or it's about to happen. With Pinterest, you might be interested in content that has to be local that you could pull up from three years ago. I mean, we're trying to surface content for people that feels relevant to them, feels local to them, um, and doesn't feel like it's outdated. And that's kind of the challenge in making sure that the product is optimized and also is it the, that they're not seeing American content. And for us, that's probably 
we knew that intuitively going in, but I think we're still realizing and honing and really putting a lot of engineering resource around this whole idea of localization so that the product feels French or the product feels Japanese. And we often hear, whether again it's through journalists or pinners or through our market research, like don't make assumptions. Lauren, is, is there any distinction when you, I mean, actually going from New York to LA to now Chicago, I mean, Swathi and Heather have talked about international, and mm -hmm. that feels more obvious in some ways, like culturally, there's a huge divide. There are those common examples, the same thing with football, right, is that, you know, if you go in, I think it's little nuanced things, like, I think a big pet peeve of mine is when companies send out emails and the subject line is like, hello, Chicago, we're here, right? And, and <laughs> that just like feels very much like you're entering a city with this grand entrance as if everyone in Chicago cares that you're there. <laughs> it's first and foremost, like what do, does your service mean to that city? And, and the best kind of example is, you know, when Uber goes to a city, like for example, we use Uber for commuting. In Austin, Texas, um, you know, they're, right, they're in between, you know, Friday and Sunday, people are using Uber a lot more because they're using it for a designated driver. And so what I always try to think of is like, who are our high frequency shippers in every market and every single market is different. And so doing that research up front, I think is really, really important. So we're gonna to move to a little bit about community since you also um, led community at TaskRabbit and this is something that is can be a very expensive endeavor for a lot of companies who have to build on offline communities. Mm -hmm. I'm really curious um, how you're doing that at SHIP or if that's a meaningful part of the growth strategy at all. Yeah, I think definitely. So when I was entertaining the idea of coming to SHIP, one of the things based on my experience at TaskRabbit that was extremely important to me was that there were eventual plans to transition the courier community from um, 1099 to W2. Um, I'd really learned a lot of hard lessons around what a brand experience is like if you have a 1099 workforce um, through working at TaskRabbit, meaning you can't prescribe training, you can't have them wear a uniform, you can't um, give them, you know, and you can't really subscribe any sort of, of training. And that makes the brand experience with the user very wonky because if you can't provide them a script or have them ask them to wear the same thing when they're walking to the door, the amount of trust that the customer feels um, is very low and there's also a lot of a skepticism that comes along with that. Um, and I knew that I wanted to really, the next endeavor, build a really cohesive brand experience. And so um, that was something Kevin and I had committed to very early on um, and has been huge in both our community building but also our brand building. Uh, because we're able to now, you know, every time a ship courier walks to your door, they're wearing a ship jacket. They ask you every time if you're if you're aware of what's going to happen to your item after it leaves your hands. Um, they are equipped with knowledge to help you understand where your item's going and make you feel really safe using us. And I also do think, you know, it's kind of a, a bolder statement, but I think in community building now, um, it's extremely difficult to build supply um, right now. It's very competitive. You have companies like you know, Uber and Lyft and Postmates and um, that you're all competing to build your supply. And churn is really high at a lot of these companies. So becoming known for treating your employees really, really well um, is something that's incredibly important to us at SHIP and that I, you know, spend a lot of time and energy thinking about. Um, and particularly at marketing orgs, a lot of these um, supply constrained companies are spending 80% of their marketing dollars on bringing in supply. So what's happening is they're burning and churning people very, very quickly. Um, and we see a lot of ex-Postmates. We see a lot of ex-Uber drivers coming in. And so really fostering that community is extremely important to us. Uh, we obsess over our customer experience, but it's just as important to make sure that you're obsessing over your, your career experience and your workforce experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's super interesting. So from a customer perspective, though, I know Ben Silverman talked <laughs> a lot about, you know, everyone thinks that Pinterest sort of like grew like this, but in reality, for a very long mm -hmm. time, they actually grew offline. He mm -hmm. talked a lot about those pinner communities that they would have, Absolutely. the parties. And is that still something that Pinterest does, by the way, um, today? Is we, that something you guys nurture in terms of actual regional communities? We, we do it internationally, definitely, because Pinterest as a product is something you have to use and feel and touch, and the community is the best way to evangelize and educate about how to use the product. Um, today, we're roughly, just a little under, but roughly about 50-50, so 50% of our community is outside the, the US. Um, we have 100 million um, monthly active users. The community is everything. I mean, I think that what is you know on Ben's mind the most is making sure that 
the, we keep innovating the product to keep the community loyal and engaged. And that is at the end of the day, you know, we have these company values. Um, there are four of them, but one of them is put pinners first. And so the community really is everything. What are the touch points with pinners? Uh, the offline ones, the ones that are actually person to person today. So it's, what's really interesting is that I mentioned earlier that we don't have local marketing people in each of the countries, mm -hmm. but we have community people. And so the, the, it's a very high touch model. Um, actually, a couple of our community managers came out of Yelp, so, you know, just bringing the best of the, the Yelp experience. Um, we host events. Um, they're doing education workshops. We pull out influencers, so within the community, and that's where PR for us, that's the real sweet spot, is we take the, the heavy power users of Pinterest, if you will, we call them notable names, and we put a spotlight on them in the press, and that helps educate and inform more about the product and how you know, cool and interesting ways that people are, are using the product. But even just anecdotally, because I've spent several years living in London, and I go back quite a bit, just friends are having Pinterest parties. Like, hey, come over, we're gonna have, we're gonna have a pinning party. And that's totally informal and kind of organic. Um, and it's something that we hmm. saw in the very early days here in the US as well. So, I mean, I'm still trying to wrap my head around, you said you don't have the marketing managers locally, but these are happening. Like, how are they actually happening? I mean, so, maybe there's this enthusiasm around Pinterest today, but I imagine there's companies here where that hasn't occurred yet. So how do they actually build that from nothing? So, um, the, the community manager is almost in a way kind of double in some ways as a marketing manager. Okay. I think that's probably safe to say. Um, but the community managers are planning events. It varies, but probably two or three times a quarter. Again, that varies, but it's usually around a theme. And um, we've had tremendous success from a press perspective because when there's a gathering of pinners and they're doing something really creative and fun with the product, and usually what we do is take an idea, whether it is a... Um, an influencer who's a famous chef, we take the pins and we bring it to action. So that's where the moment, we create this PR moment, which becomes a really fun story to tell. So in the early days, one of the things that we learned very quickly in San Francisco was that farmers markets and sellers events were actually very, very powerful organic mechanisms for us because there was a high density of people that were selling things and a high density of people that were walking in and looking to buy. And it was a largely cash-based ecosystem. So lo and behold, if you gave free readers to all of these merchants and set them up on accounts, you all of a sudden had thousands of people that were coming through like in the ferry building on a Saturday that were experiencing the product. And it became this phenomenon. So then all of a sudden, our growth strategy became in part to hire young college kids and to seed as many of the big farmers markets around the country as we possibly could. And what that meant was when we took the movement across the border to Canada, um, you could go to a farmer's market and ask someone, do you know Square? And they would say, no, because we had no brand recognition. But there was this universal sign language of, well, have you seen this thing? <laughs> and they would be like, oh, yeah, that thing. Are you here already? Um, and that, I think, was really powerful. In a way, that was our first foray into community building. And over time, that became a movement because it wasn't just about getting those guys signed up as customers. But those were the testimonials that we would replay in the press briefs. That was what we tried to get local, regional, and national press coverage. So we would take these extractable lessons that we'd see play out at a community level and then really try and amplify it. Um, and the result was magic. I mean, it is the only enterprise company that I am aware of where 50% of our growth in the early days was organic. So how do you make these customers, these users, evangelists? I think the more you build a product that literally speaks for itself or that makes people want to talk about it, the more your job on the marketing side is to take those seeds and amplify, but it's a lot harder when you don't have that baked into product, I think, to try and compensate for that in your brand efforts and your marketing efforts and your communications efforts. I think we're lucky. We have a really great, enthusiastic base of people that want to talk about Pinterest and who are using it. So mining for them, I mean, sure, there's so much more that we need to be doing to try and keep building our base of evangelists. But How do you mine for them? Do you find them on social media? Are you emailing them because um, through Pinterest? What, what are those? You know, it's, a, it's a really great question. I mean, um, so one of the things we do see is that a lot of celebrities and, you know, people who have high profiles have uh, fake names uh, for their Pinterest accounts. So it's really hard to actually find them because it's a very personal product. In terms of bringing new folks on, very often what we do is this is where the kind of the synergy between PR and community works is we will 
we will tell the community team, hey, this is a great person um, who's kind of a leading chef or a uh, leading fashionista, fashionista in beauty or you name it across all of our categories and we will try and onboard them onto Pinterest. And once we find that that person, like we just did this in Japan actually with, um, with a really amazing fashionista and the PR agency literally went to this woman and said, you are a fashion icon, you have to be on Pinterest. And so we sat down with her with a product there's no money that changes hands, by the way. Like we don't pay people because the authenticity is really important that if you're going to be out there talking about it, we don't want that to be because we're paying you to do it. And she loved the product, started pinning and then held an event for us. And it was actually around Halloween, which is becoming such a big deal outside the US. <laughs> In some ways it's a bottom up, um, but then we also do take a very proactive approach and it's, but it's pretty high touch. Mm -hmm. So to your point about scalability, one thing we haven't been able to crack is like, you know, if events and, you know, influencer building and all of that is not because you're just sending an email. It requires somebody sitting with you and it's a very high touch model. Do you have online communities? So I think um, I recently had a, a panel with Slack and they mm -hmm. actually organically Slack has a lot of um, communities online already. People who mm -hmm. just like love Slack, talk about Slack, talk about Slack features all day long. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they tap into them. Um, and so they really nurture those communities, whether they give them actual new features first or sort of ways to bring them in. I don't know if they're online communities that you guys can talk about because you guys have talked a lot about offline so far. Yeah, no, we don't, um, we don't really do offline or online communities. We do, um, the way we find our, our power users is just by the data itself. We just pull reports of the particular segments that we're looking for and really reach out to them. And un unlike Heather, money does exchange hands with us. We don't pay people to evangelize us, but look, the, the likelihood of finding an eBay seller and them knowing other eBay sellers is really high. Um, and these people are savvy small business owners. Um, and so saying, hey, we're going to up the ante of our referral program. Mm -hmm. If you refer another eBay seller, we're going to sweeten the pot for you. Yeah. Um, and they get really excited about that. So we find that really our power users like compound on themselves if we sweeten the pot. And then also, um, you know, we find ways to really feature them in our marketing materials and, and leverage them in different ways. And they love that and they see it as a way of them of us helping them market their business so I think one thing in terms of all marketing mixes that I, I've talked to a lot of companies so far is this shift towards owned content mm -hmm. um, being a bigger and bigger or more meaningful part of the marketing strategy can you talk about that through the lens of expanding um, in new markets or new regions what you know what is that what is that content strategy when you go into a new new market for us um, Again, it comes all it comes back to the product. So one of the things that I mean, our content strategy right now is first and foremost. And I think, um, being honest, one of the things we've realized is that we need to be moving faster um, when it comes to our content strategy. And it, and it comes back to that localization. So for pinners to be able to today in France, um, we just had this um, really great case study in France. Um, Today, 45% of the content in France is local. Now, we do see that um, our international pinners do want some US content, but they also want local content. We've got to get probably to a better place where our content strategy is increasing the localization, but that is a gargantuan effort. So we're really, really, really focused on the engineering side and making sure that at the same time there's localization, that we're also innovating new products because there's this whole kind of race for keeping that keeping ourselves relevant at the same time that we're also innovating and, and trying to boost our engagement. My strategy to date has been not produce content if it's not going to be really, really good content. So I've been working, we hired a creative director um, who's partnering with our director of growth to really think about like what are the stories that we want to tell. And what's coming out of that are themes like we really want to tell the story of our packaging. We hear all the time from our customers that they open a box and are just like, wowed by our professional packaging. Um, it's something we do really well and it's kind of really interesting to see what does it look like to package a bike. Um, and so we're, we're gonna be doing, it's, it's kind of cool. Um, or a samurai sword, any of these sorts of things. Um, so we're gonna be building content around key themes that we've pulled out of user research that people really wanna see. Um, and then in Q1, we're really gonna focus on marrying content with our growth strategy. And so putting a lot of time and energy around 
you know, our YouTube channel. Um, and that's going to be like a quarterly, a quarterly goal for us is, is a metric on how much growth do we want to get out of this YouTube channel and really investing, um, in getting that out and really, you know, getting a wide reach on those, those videos. So when you think about YouTube as a channel, mm -hmm. what kind of content are you envisioning? Uh, maybe you haven't thought it completely through yet. Is it how to's for small medium businesses? Is it like big win stories where, yeah. um, you know, the, the small medium business or the small business was able to deliver a product that, you know, got in the hands safely to a yeah. customer. Like what is that own content strategy look like? What do you think those stories look like today? So there's two. So we just had a, a big, two day offsite earlier this week talking through what these are going to look like. And so I, I don't have a fully concrete answer, but I have the front runner winners of, of what I think it's going to look like. I, I think where the direction that we've decided to go is really, you know, using this as a way to elevate Kevin as a thought leader as well and building out content um, for not only, you know, sellers in market, but out of market and really positioning ship as the go-to brand um, for small to medium sized businesses that are selling on marketplaces. Things like how to package an item, um, how to promote your marketplace on a social media channel, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be, you know, sort of the more uh, kind of how to white paperish content in the form of a video. And then we're also brainstorming some other really funny things. One is a concept that we call Will It Break, which is based off the Will It Blend videos. <laughs> so that we are so confident in our packaging, um, our packaging competencies that, you know, we actually have a forklift in our warehouse that, you know, our creative director, myself and a few others went down and we said, okay, here's a, here's a cinema display, package it. And then we're going to go all the way to the top and we're going to drop it. And we're going to record it. And our techs are like, you're going to do what? <laughs> but we did it with guitars and we did it with laptops and we did it with fragile vases and, and nothing breaks. A content strategy, it is so important to anchor it in really measurable results. So what is the, a strategy for? What is it that you intend uh, to measure its success and performance by? Um, and at Square, it was really about three core things. So we lived and died by these three numbers, not actually died, but, <laughs> um, you know, activations. So we cared about whether or not new people were signing up for the product. And so we had a set of content that was very much about introducing what this meant actually for someone and why there was value in it. There was a second core set of numbers around engagement because it turns out that on day two, after on day one, you have figured out how to get someone to sign up for the product. You have to make sure that they continue using it. And there, especially... Um, there had just been an explosion in complexity in our product because we went from being a card reader with basically a glorified calculator and software to extremely complicated software that you would use to send invoices, to run your taxes, to run payroll. Um, and so there was a whole host of content to educate you on, did you know you could do these new things with Square? And maybe this is more relevant for you as a contractor versus this is less relevant for you or more relevant for you as a retail store. And then the third set of metrics were around churn and unhappy experiences. So we actually pegged content to minimize support inquiries, for example. So if we knew that there were top kind of 10 inquiries that were coming into our support channel, and we actually have real people that are replying live because it turns out the movement of money is a very sensitive topic for people. <laughs> um, so the metric there was, could we actually decrease the volume of inbound support inquiries by proactively putting content out there via a help center in both text and video? Uh, and so that's how the content strategy emerged. It was, a, it was a very practical set of tools that were tied to numbers, and we knew if it worked or not based on how those numbers moved. Mm -hmm. One of the, the sort of challenges of growing ex, you know, uh, and expanding to new markets is the challenge of resources. <coughs> so I'm constantly having conversations with our company saying, well, should I bring this in-house or should I do this um, with a vendor or service provider? Are there things that you just cannot um, let other uh, service providers do, things that you must hold in-house? I mean, sort of, what's the philosophy there at, at your companies? From a comms perspective, the more you can hold in-house, the better. I completely agree with that. I think early, um, the first hire I made was a head of comms. Um, I, and I think it, it, it was myself leading um, as the first marketing hire, and then it was a head of comms at TaskRabbit. Uh, I think that you absolutely, if you depend on organic growth, need to have that competency in-house. PR can really do wonders as far as um, setting the entire stage for what the perception of your business is early on um, and is a huge lever for us for growth. Um, and, you know, it elevates the brand and it really allows you to control the narrative. And I uh, have worked with agencies um, and I, I, I don't, and I've worked in an agency, and I, I think the level of trust there for me personally is, is low, especially early days. 
I think it's wholly stage dependent. I mean, I think it's a idealistic wish list thing to say that you're able to do everything in-house, but the reality is when it's a few people hacking away in a garage and you know that all of a sudden you've got to sort of start thinking about how to grow something externally, you make trade-offs and there will be decisions to bring agencies in to help with things. So I think the best advice there is to just be smart about it and to realize that there is a real art and science to managing agencies. So bringing on an agency will seem like a short-term panacea to your lack of resources. Like, I'm just going to hire someone to do it on the outside. No. You're just signing up for a different type of work. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that someone else is suddenly going to do the work. It's yeah. that your job has gone from generating the content to managing the person that's going to generate the content. And just accept that the trade-off there is they're slightly less familiar. They are not necessarily going to have the same care or concern as you know this baby that you have just birthed with your team. Really appreciate you guys coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.